they, when they're over at my house, they manage their own bees. So they have come with me tonight. We made a little mini vacation out of coming up to the area and spending the night in Lake George. So why be a keeper? Because it is amazing. She left, so that's good because she's having a little bit of a struggle. So a lot of times we think we can just take some bees and put them in our backyard and go collect some honey and yay, that's keeping bees. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But it is an incredible and amazing hobby, and I am thrilled that I do it. Um, this is Riley, and the girls love going in and having the bees come right up to them. Uh, bees are basically gentle. They are stinging insects, but as long as I do my job carefully and quietly, they do their job without any problems. So, We'll talk a little bit about being a beekeeper and the amazing honey because it is my most favorite thing. So why keep bees? They are amazing. They care about their family. We need them for pollination. They make honey and thank goodness most of the time they make it up to share and they dance and it is a great hobby. And then we're also going to talk about what you need to keep bees. Okay, right? Isn't she lovely? Now, People look at insects and I just look at insects and think they were a little creepy looking. I wasn't real crazy about them, but I think the honeybee is beautiful. And this is a honeybee on goldenrod, which is one of their favorite fall flowers. And the honey, no, I take that back. This is fresh honey. Uh, most of my honey harvesting is in the fall and most of it is goldenrod honey. And you can see from this amazing little bee, um, at the ends of her legs, she has little claws. She uses those to hold on to the flowers. You can see her long tongue that is sticking deep into that flower. Honey she has a tongue that is half the length of her body. That would be like if you guys were all bees and you stuck out your tongue and it went all the way to your belly button. That's how long their tongue is. And it has adapted over time to become longer. And it is hollow like a straw so that they're able to suck up the nectar. And it's nectar that they use to turn into delicious honey. So when I'm teaching children about honeybees, I would say it's flower juice. And as we know, juice is not honey. It needs to be thickened. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And another thing that is really amazing about the honeybee is that she is covered in hair from the top of her little head to her claws, even her eyes are covered with hair, and you can see it better in the photo than I draw. The reason she is covered in hair is because that is how she collects pollen, which is, as I'm sure most of you know, it's the powder on the flower that, in order for pollination to occur, it needs to go from one flower to another of the same, so it can create more flowers and delicious fruits and vegetables. When she flies, she can fly up to 15 miles an hour, become charged. They become electric. And when she lands in that flower, that pollen sticks to those hairs as if they were magnets. Once her body becomes very full of pollen, she has to put it somewhere because she gets very heavy and she can't continue to fly. However, she has been told that she needs to visit 100 flowers before she can go back home again. So now she's got this flower to put it somewhere. So she takes her front legs, which have hair on them, but the hairs on her front legs are like bristles. And she brushes all of that hair off of her eyes, her antenna, her wings, and she packs it into her pockets. They're called pollen pants, pollen pockets, pollen pouches. They're extra long hairs on the back legs that she is able to put that pollen and create little pouches and continue to collect it until she visits her 100 flowers and can go home and unload those. So we talked about her tongue already and her hair, but let's talk a little bit about her eyes. She has amazing eyes. Does anybody know how many eyes a honeybee has? You can't answer. And neither can you three. How many eyes do you think a honeybee has? Five, that's right. A honeybee has five eyes. She has two large complex eyes on kind of on the side of her head. And they are made up of thousands of tiny little lenses. Each lens takes a little snapshot of what she's looking at. 
tells a little tiny brain that is the size of a poppy seed, but is absolutely incredible what she sees. It's like a mosaic. The brain puts those together. They can recognize faces. They can recognize flower shapes. They can recognize their home. When new babies are coming out of their cell, all of a sudden there will be the bees flying in front of the hive and they go up and down in front of the hive and they are orienting. They are recognizing their home. They're looking for things. On this one, you can see I have painted some uh, a bee and some hexagons on there. So they look for colors and look for shapes and they look for landmarks. They also have three tiny little eyes on top of their head. And you can see one right in the center. Looks like a little bubble. That is one of her simple eyes. She has three. Those help her to navigate, keep her flying straight. They help her to locate the sun when she is looking for flowers. And they help to recognize shadows. Uh, she has two antenna. They are also covered with hair, but these are neurotransmitters. She does not have a nose. However, she can smell. When she's looking for the right flower, she finds them by sight. The large eyes can also find ultraviolet light, so she can find special flowers that have ultraviolet color. Um, they can also kind of talk to each other. They can feel their way around inside of the dark hive. Um, how many wings do they have? How many wings do you think a honeybee has? Four. Oh, that's right. She has two sets of two, and they hook together with a little hand in line, which is a hook. And she hooks them together when she's flying. When she's in the hive, she unhooks them, and they help to keep the hive warm by shrugging their shoulders, which are really shoulders, but the tops of their wings. Okay, I think we covered. You can see in this picture to the right, you can see the long, long hairs on the back legs, which are the ones that they use for pockets. Okay, right? This is the whole family. So I don't know if any of you have had to endure this, but when my children were young, every year we did a family photo. It has taken me six years to get a family photo of my honeybees because the drones, the boy bees, are not usually anywhere near the queen. So you'll notice, maybe you've noticed, every time I'm talking about a bee, I keep saying she. That's because guess who does? all the work inside and outside the hive, the girls. The worker bees, the girl bees do almost all of the work. The boy bees don't do much at all. And there is no reason for, her, for the, him to be anywhere near the queen because she is laying eggs and those are the babies that are going to be fed and cared for by nurse bees, which are young worker bees. So we don't usually get to see the boy and the girl and the queen, but I did it. So the queen, yes, I use that great shot. That is the queen. She is the largest bee. There is one, only one, but there has to be a queen. Um, she, you can see her wings only go about halfway down her abdomen. Her abdomen is so long because it is filled with eggs. When a queen is brand new, she flies out of the hive. She flies 300 feet straight up in the air. She mates with at least three, probably up to 12 drones who instantly die. She comes back to the hive. She usually does that a couple of days. She then is able to lay up to 2,000 eggs a day for her entire life, which can be up to five years. Unfortunately, the queens don't eat. Long, but she could lay eggs for up to five years. So that is why her abdomen is so long. You can see she has a little bit of red on her thorax. And that is a human thing. We as beekeepers oftentimes mark our queens because it is imperative that we have a queen. If we don't have a queen, we don't have a hive. Because if she's not laying eggs, those worker bees, the little girl bees, they only live six weeks in the summer. So if she is not continuing to replenish the stock, we are going to be out of bees. Um, so the worker, the drone, right, to get a point to that, that big old guy, he's the second largest. 
He is very easy to find by his ginormous eyes that are on top of his head. His eyes are the entire top of his head, and it is that old story of the better to see you with. So his eyes are so big so we can find the queen because that's all the drones do. They go leave the hive every day. They go to a drone congregating area, say any place where they might have smoke cigars all day waiting for a queen. They cannot mate with a queen in their own hive. They have to mate with a queen from another hive. Wait for a queen, and their life is over. But that's his family. Their life is going to be over soon anyway. I'll tell you about that in a second. So you can see how much wider they are. My bees are so well behaved that they stood side by side. So right next to it is a worker bee. And you can see how much smaller she is. She is shorter, she is narrower, and her eyes are smaller. So I told you the worker bee lives six weeks. Does anybody know? How long a drone lives? Until he mates. <laughs> How long do they live? Until it gets cold. So the girls, the worker bees, literally do all the work. They take care of the babies, they build the house, they collect the groceries, the pollen and the nectar, everything that they need, they get from flowers, they collect all of that turn that nectar into honey. Now it's getting cold. Are there flowers in the winter time? No, not so much. So the honeybees have to stay clustered up in the winter. The winter worker bees can live six months, but the honey that is left in that hive, that is all they have to eat until pretty much the dandelions come out, which we know is usually April, March or April. So again, it's like the old story about the hen that collected the grain and nobody wanted to help her plant it or turn it into bread, but they certainly wanted to help eat it. It's the same way the boys did not do any of the work within the hive. So when winter comes, the girls start looking around and they say, huh, we only have this much and it has to last us all the winter. The boys didn't help make it or really with any of all those heavy work. So they, the boys do not even feed themselves. They do not sing. They don't have singers. They do not have a long tongue. So they stop feeding them and they start getting a little weak in the knees. And the girls kick them out of the hive and they do not let them back in. So the boys live until the girls decide they're, it's too cold. And we are going to get rid of this extra baggage that we don't need. Sorry, guys, that's that story. Next one. Specialty bees, there's one queen, any of the female bees, one queen. So, is she a specialty bee? Is she born a queen, or can any old worker bee become a queen? She is special. And if she is not working up full parts, so a worker bee cannot become a queen. If a hive becomes queenless, so something happens, oh, maybe a careless beekeeper accidentally squishes her, and there is no queen. Worker bees can lay eggs. However, they can only lay unfertilized eggs, which are always going to be drones. A queen decides if she is going, she has, in that abdomen, she has fertilized and unfertilized eggs. She takes her antenna and she feels inside the cell because the worker bees will make a bigger opening if it's supposed to be, if they need some boys. So she feels, and then she lays a fertilizer and unfertilized. So worker bees can lay unfertilized eggs, which is useless, right? Sorry, guys. Ooh, that was that could have got bad. So we need a lot of boys. We need more girl bees. So what they will do is they will take one of the eggs that the queen has laid. If, it, if they are queenless or the queen is not doing her job, she is only laying 500 eggs a day. So they will take one of those eggs. They have the ability to make baby food in their heads. 
Uh, nurse bees that are about three to five days old, these have different jobs throughout their lifespan. At about three to five days old, in their brain, nurse babies make royal jelly. You may have heard of that. It's, it's a really, uh, some people eat it. It is a good um, antibiotic, has lots of great health benefits for humans. She, all babies, all baby larvae receive it for one day. Then the rest of the babies get bee bread, which is a combination of pollen and nectar or honey mixed together. That special egg that they pick gets fed oral jelly for three, possibly up to six days. She becomes a queen. In a little while, when Riley gets to that, they, they create, it looks like a peanut, and they create a longer cell because she is so big. She needs a lot of room. It can't just be bigger diameter. It has to accommodate her whole body. And they make a new queen who then is the virgin queen and needs to go out and make the boys happy. Does she uh, go find another hive? Or, or? No, she will be the queen of that hive. When hive swarms, and, and we're gonna, it's going to come up, but we're going to talk about it now, and then we'll just freeze through it when we get to it. When a hive becomes overloaded, there's just not enough room. There, there's not enough. The, the queen doesn't care for her babies, but she releases a pheromone, a scent, that lets the bees know she is there. And when there's a lot of bees, her scent isn't as strong, so they will swarm. When they swarm, they start creating a new queen because they are a social insect and they love their family and they care for their family. They will not, half of them are going to leave, but they won't leave until they have started to create a new queen. So two weeks before they swarm, they start talking, the girls start mumbling amongst themselves and having a plan. They start feeding a baby extra. Actually, they will do about six to 10 queens to be sure we have a good viable one. Um, so once it is like within three to five days of that queen emerging, half of the bees with the original queen will leave and they will find a new home unless the beekeeper finds them first. And then she will bring them home. <laughs> if you want to I will create a new for you. Uh, but the then the new queen will be the queen of that hive. So when she comes out of her cell, she then is the ruler of Bruce. She is the new queen. Okay, any other questions on the well, just One other question. So the, the queen will, you know, for like three or four days, whatever, will go in and mate. And then she's good, like up to five years. Does she have to mate again or literally the one time? Yes, okay. Um, and then, so I know, it's like a how amazing they are, but they are so amazing. Mm -hmm. So when they're born, they are cleaner bees. So as soon as they are born, they work and they turn around and they clean out their hive. Then they are nurse bees and they feed, and then they do some more feeding. Eventually they are builder bees. They start building their house. Um, then they are guard bees, they protect. Honeybees do sting, which I, I kind of mentioned when I first started, we were just chatting. They are stinging insects, but they only sting if they're terrified. They only sting to protect themselves or their family. They do not chase us to sting us unless we really do something awful. It happened to me once. And then they really do not fly until they're about 22 days old. They work within the house, within the hive, until they're 21, 22 days old, and then they become foragers. It's kind of like the last hurrah. They go out and they collect pollen and nectar. And it's kind of a little bit sad, so they do that for the last couple of weeks of their life. That honey that they are making, they, they're not even eating it. They're making it for the next generation of bees. They're making it for those winter girls that are going to live through the winter and help start the family in the spring. Okay, right? And is it true that if they sing you, they die? They do. They're, they're stinger. So, again, boys do not sting, only girls. So, the queen and the workers can all sting. The worker bee stinger is barbed and it's just like a fish hook. So, it has little pieces coming up. So they sting you, they attempt to 
to fly away and it removes some of the inside comes outside so they cannot survive. They can sting other insects and survive, but they cannot sting humans and most mammals and survive. So they are the same because that's they're done. Doesn't mean they don't. The queens that spanky were recently did mention that. So the queen also can sting. Her stinger is like a pin. It is straight, no barb. She can sting as many times as she wants. However, she gets pushed. <laughs> she gets pushed. Thank you. However, she does not leave the hive. The only time she leaves the hive is initially when she's a brand new queen. Otherwise, she does not leave the hive. She uses her stinger to sting other queens. So remember I said, they're gonna make about six to 10 new queens, hoping that one of them will survive. Uh, because sometimes they get mated and they get eaten by a bird or another bug and they don't come home. So they make spares. So when the first mated queen returns, she pipes and she makes a noise and it sounds like this. And she's kind of goes to the other queen cells. She rips the hole in it with her little jaws and she stings other queens. <laughs> so her stinger is only used to claim her crown. Um, this, their two little bees are tongue to tongue. When they bring nectar back into the hive, they do not have time to put it in. These are all in large cells. They do not have time to put it into those cells. Because remember, I said they have to visit 100 flowers. They have to do it 10 times. So they visit 1,000 flowers a day. So it's like, quick, come back. Get out there and collect some more groceries. So there are receiver bees that receive the nectar. And then they put it into a cell, and then the rest of the bees begin fanning it with their wings to thicken it and dry it. And all of this comb is made out of beeswax. And I have some up here, I'll pass it around in a little bit. That is made from bees when they're about 12 days old. I said they become builder bees. Well, on the right, you can see they have glands on the underside of their abdomen, piece of wax come off, they chew it with their jaws and create each and every one of those individual cells. Okay, right? Oh, so I got this happened. My very first year of beekeeping, so beekeeping easy. My first year was going well. I had one hive that was surviving. And this big old black bear came to my house. And so it was awful. Um, but it's kind of cool that I got a picture of the bear. <laughs> there, he sat in my backyard from seven o'clock at night until one o'clock in the morning. Bears come in the spring for the bees and the larvae. The queen does not lay in the yeah, she does not lay in the winter time. But in January, she starts laying. So when spring comes, because it takes 21 days for an egg to become a bee, so she starts laying. So in March, when this bad boy came to my house, um, there was larva in that hive. So they have gone all this winter without eating. So they come for the bees and the larva. They stay, Ruby, you're right, for the honey. So. He did eat honey. He hid, you can see how he broke everything apart. He hid two frames under leaves so that when he came back the next day, he still had some. Of course, I cleaned everything up. We put up a trail cam to see if he would come back again. And he did. He went up to, I have a huge close up of his face. He went up to the trail cam, threw it into the yard. Yeah. So, he didn't come back again to this. I now have a bear face, which <laughs> because you know, fool me once, <laughs> shame on you. Okay, so they protect their family from bears. Bears are so thick in fur that they really do not feel these things. They really don't do a good job protecting their hide from bear. Oh, right. They are pollinators. This is a raspberry. All 
the pictures, with the exception of that wax gland, I haven't gotten that yet, are all pictures of my bees, my house, my yard. So this is a honeybee, and that is a raspberry blossom. And she's giving pollen, and then Eureka, those raspberry blossoms become beautiful raspberries, and it is all due to pollination. Honeybees are responsible for about a third of the food that we eat is because of insect pollination, although bats and moths and wind and other things can, honeybees do are accountable for 80% of pollination. Okay, right? They make honey. We've already talked about this. So when they have thickened the honey, it's no longer flower juice, it is thick like honey. And I have some up here that my assistant Rosie will let you try at the end. When it is thickening up, and they know because they are so smart, they cover it up with a very thin layer of wax and it looks kind of wavy like that. Once an entire frame is covered up with a thin layer of wax, we, if there's enough, we have to be sure they have enough, but they usually make enough to share. We scrape off that outer layer. We put it into an extractor using centrifugal force. We spit it. The honey comes out of those cells and drips down into the bottom. So, and then I, I use milk to buy twice, but that is it. Honey from beekeepers is raw honey. It is directly from the bees. We filter it to get rid of bee parts, you know, and um, the wax so that it is clean, but it is just pure honey from the bees, right? They dance, okay, right? We'll see if this video works. It does. So, oh, good job. So see the little girl with the pollen on her in her pockets? They can wiggle up and she comes down, watch her. She's gonna go and look at they're starting to follow her. Now she's coming up, she goes up, 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 and she circles around. Okay, right, we enter, enter just to get past that. Look at it again, honey. So they um when good job. And then you can put, you can leave it like that. That's fine for right now. So when uh, a forager finds a field of flowers. So imagine you have to visit a hundred flowers. Now I have all kinds of beautiful flowers in my house, but that's a few here and a few there. You seem to be visiting my flowers at the end of the day when they're done, they'll be like, oh, I'll take a little of this before I go home. But ideally they want to go to a place where they can visit many flowers at once. So they find a field of sunflowers. They are so excited. They hurry home. They go into the hive. And remember, the hive is dark. There is one little opening. That's the only light inside of this. So everything, even this dance, this waggle dance that they do is done in the dark. And they use a sun as the guide. They're telling, it's BGPS, they're telling their sister, that's brother still there, that listen, go out of the hive, look for the sun. So when the frame is like this, if they fly straight up, they're saying go out, go straight to where the sun is. If they go a little to the left or a little to the right, they're saying go to the left or the right of the sun. And then the waggle, the, where they go back and forth like that, tells them how far away it is. And they come around, it's a figure eight, and they waggle up and they come around and they continue to do it. The wider it is, the farther they have to go, the faster they go, the more excited they are. And the number of times also determines distance. And as you saw, other bees will start following. She has pollen on her leg so they can smell it. She has, she shared, she will share a little nectar with them so they can taste it. They leave that high and they can find that that field of flowers and they can remember for three days. Go ahead. <laughs> Double click, honey. Perfect. So yeah, you did. Can you you can go back to one? So now we're going to talk about how to keep and inspect bees. So what I said, like I said when we first started, it's not just putting bees in your backyard. They require a great deal of care and attention. And it involves opening up that hive and getting right down and deep with those bees. So this is what it looks like when I first open up a hive. There are thousands. 
each of my beehives right now, we have four. Each of the girls have one, and I have one. Guess whose hive is doing the worst? That's right, mine. Each of those hives have at least 40,000 bees right now. They can have up to 60,000 bees. Um, so, and it is work. It is a bit of a job. So go ahead now with that one. So the first thing, I want to be a keeper, and I'm pleased. I am not discouraging you. It is an amazing hobby. It takes a lot of learning and time. Your first year, it's, it is tough. It's kind of a bear attack. It, it takes a while to feel more confident, and it's always changing. So here is my apiary, which is my bee yard. And this is actually last year. As I told you, I have four this year. I do not have this many. We had too many last year. Um, and that's Rosie standing in the middle. And as you can see, we start with one box at the bottom thing, right? And that is what we call the brood box. And that is where the queen lays and babies are born. And then we continue to add smaller boxes on top. And that is for storing honey. Now, it doesn't mean the queen doesn't lay in those other ones. Sometimes she does, but that is the plan. So the taller it is, the more honey we're expecting from that hive. And we keep, so we talked a little bit about swarms. We'll talk about it again. Um, in order to keep them from swarming, we need to give them room because if there are 60,000 bees, and she's laying 2,000 a day, the population is expanding quickly. So we add boxes to give them room in addition to giving them a place to store them. Hey, Brian. So first you set up your bee yard, um, generally in the sun, too much shade, they're a little lazy, so they really like to, they start getting going in the sun. This is what a hive looks like. It starts with a bottom box, a bottom board. And then, like I said, we can start adding boxes. Each box has frames. And I'm going to show you when we're done, um, go through this little hive that I brought. Um, and an inner cover we can put on. This is a queen excluder. You can't see the words on there. But that keeps the queen from going into those honey supers. Um, which is the box that we call where she, they're supposed to just be putting honey. I have allowed my queen to lay up there if the population is just booming in order to prevent a swarm. Um, but once we get to a certain point, which is generally July, she flows off on the laying, and I can put that. The, the little lines on a queen excluder are too small for the queen to fit through, but not too small for the worker bees so that they can still get up there and do the honey work. Sure, absolutely. Um, why would we want to prevent swarm? Yes, the, when they swarm, so I've lost half of my colony. So I've lost half of my production field. So half of my workers that are supposed to be bringing in nectar to you. Not that that's why I do bee keeping, but it's a nice added benefit. So I've lost half of my bees. So that's part of it. Now, the, which is not as big a deal as the next part of it. So the hive that left, they have my queen, my original queen. They could go and find a new home, or as I said, or if I'm lucky enough, I can retrieve that swarm and put them in a box. But now I have a brand new hive. Now they have to build comb on all of those frames. Their house is like when you build a new house, it's the structure, but it doesn't have any rooms. So now they have to build all that before she can lay, before they can bring in any resources, not even for me, just for their family. So that is a process. So even though she is a mated queen, she can't lay until there's cells for her to lay in. And then even when she does, it's 21 days before more bees come out. So that's the negative for that group. The group that's left behind, we have virgin queen. So same thing, it's 21 days before I have any new bees. And the bees that are in there, some of them are done. You know, they, they're hitting the end of their life expectancy. So now I have a diminishing population and I have to wait for more bees. 
if they swarm late in the season, so if they swarm in May, it's worth worth a bale of hay. If they swarm in June, it's a silver spoon. If they swarm in July, let them fly because that hive that needs to start all over doesn't have time before winter to rebuild their house. And the hive that's left is also going to struggle to get winter bees because she actually does lay different eggs and the bees are healthier that survive for the winter. So it's a, it's a fine line whether or not they're going to be strong enough and there's enough of them to survive our cold winters, especially in New York. Great question. Um, Will they stop? Yeah, what the, what the, so I have had swarms in September. Why? I don't know. Because they can, because they're inside. So they're basically men Absolutely. Absolutely. But they just perceive, you know, oh, there's too many. Too many yeah. And there it is natural instincts for, for bees to swarm. They are designed to increase their yeah. species. So they want there to be more bees, more hives. So part of that swarm in nature is hard to stop sometimes. I mean, there are things we can do to try to prevent it, give them more room. And when I show you the queen cells, I'll tell you what we do to try to prevent that. But sometimes no matter what we do, they're gonna do it anyway. So now we're in August. So in theory, my bees should not swarm. I should feel comfortable. I should feel safe. I shouldn't have to look for queen cells anymore. I just got an email from one of the people that I mentor. So somebody that lives close to me, I go over and help him with his bees. He's new. And unfortunately, my friend here doesn't have that benefit. And it's tough. Uh, you don't have somebody to help you know what you're looking at. He just emailed me and said, I have six queen cells. And, and one of them is back. His bees are getting ready to swarm. And it's too late. So I, I replied, but I'll probably, there's not much, there's really nothing you can do. I mean, it, it's it's too late to, to try to prevent it because you can take those queen cells and put them in another box and create an artificial swarm, we call it a split, but it's it's too late. It's that same of now we've got a new hop and, you know, it, it's not going to, it's not going to be strong enough for winter. If they swarm now, they're not going to make it to winter. How tall is your sand group for sample population? I'm sorry, how tall how so your sand the boxes? Yeah, so I never I never go more than four boxes and I try to keep them at three. The boxes that are honey supers weigh 50 pounds. So I cannot lift it all. <laughs> we have but honey supers, I can pull out some Francis. I cannot lift those, or my husband will lift off those boxes. The girls need help. They can't lift their honey supers. They're, they are really, really heavy. The hive itself, we want that to be a couple feet off the ground, and that's because of predators. So skunks are also a big predator of honeybees, and they come up to the hive entrance, and they scratch at the entrance. So little Garby comes out and says, yes, can I help you? Boom, eats it up. And this process will continue. That's going to continue to eat up the bees by raising it up. So they will sting the skunk. Same thing as the bear doesn't feel it. However, if I raise my hive enough, the skunk now has to reach up and she, get, she or he gets stung here and that hurts and he will leave. So it's a deterrent for um, that. And other things that creep and crawl on the ground can be um, predators for our honeybees. Um, that's a great question. And, yeah, and mice. They're a big um, I wear this type of a glove for beekeeping. Um, you probably have seen lots of videos, people barehand beekeep. I do not. Um, I want to be comfortable, and I feel more comfortable wearing gloves. People say you have better dexterity, barehanded. I, I feel more comfortable. The girls are beekeepers. They wear leather gloves. So they cannot sting through leather. They can sting through this, but it's harder for them. And it's not as deep of a sting usually because they can't hold on of this, this kind of whatever it is, night briar, you know, and plastic and stuff. Um, but they cannot sting through the leather. So the girls all wear leather gloves because I want their beekeeping experience to be really good. And you can see that the girls wear full suits tucked in boots. Um, I do not, those are not, it is not a suit, I wear a jacket and I cut my pants in my socks. 
Um, so that's the, that's our gear. That's what we wear when we go out and um, inspect our bees. Upper right hand corner is a smoker. We use a smoker to direct and quiet the bees. So by puffing a little smoke in the top of the hive, they're going to go down into the hive away from the smoke. Some people think it's, well, they smell smoke and they think there's fire. So they you know, want to get away from it. Um, we don't use much of it. We use a little bit and we always use it when we open a hive so they know what's coming. And then that in the middle is a hive tool. The bees, in addition to making honey and royal jelly and wax, they make something called propolis. We call it bee glue, and it is bee spackle. They use it to fill every crack and crevice, every little tiny hole or opening. This was around an upper entrance, and I put this so um, just to keep other critters out. They felt it was too big, and you can see all this orange. This is propolis. They use tree sap, plant sap, and mix it with honey, so sticky, sticky times two, and they fill holes, which makes us as beekeepers, when we're opening a hive, they stick those frames down too, so we fry those out, okay, right? So the first thing we do is we remove the inner cover, so this particular hive, um, we have just one cover, but so we remove the cover. Okay, right? And there, this is not a full honey super. So this is Rosie lifting a hive box that is not full of honey. We hold it close to our bodies because we don't want to drop that. These do not like to be dropped on the ground. So we remove that. You can see that one does have a queen excluder on it. And this allows us to get down into the meat of the hive and see, look for the queen, look for things that we need to see when we're inspecting. Okay, right? So we then remove a frame, and this is what a brand new frame looks like. And this is like the walls that I'm telling you about. These are the walls within the house. This has foundation on it, and it does have an imprint of the hexagon. The bees do not need it. They build hexagons no matter what. This just gives them a surface to get started on, but they cannot do anything with this. They have to put wax on this and create all of those cells. So we pull them up. Eventually, they look like this, where they are covered with cells. The corner of this is capped honey. This tan would be capped babies. Uh, babies, the brood is, is what capped babies are called. It has to be kept 95 degrees in temperature. So this is a hive that did not survive. These babies don't survive either because it's not 95. You can notice this is Riley lifting it. So she's hoping that these tabs fit in the hive, but they're also what we are to hold on to because you never know where you might be right and you so in that circle right at the top of that hive is the queen right on top so if i lifted this like this i just switched my queen now i have a problem so if i switch her maybe they can create a new one if there's some eggs there or i have a big problem so we be, we lift very carefully like this and we be careful that we do not switch our queen okay right here is another um, video of a little bit of me doing an inspection. So you can see I'm, I'm sliding that frame. I'm using that eye tool ugh, to pry them apart because they have stuck them together. And then I use it on the edges to pry it up. And you can see the bees are flying around, but they're, they're not upset that I'm there. They're doing their thing. I'm doing my thing. I'm gonna give them a little bit of smoke. So when I pull that frame, it doesn't have quite as many bees on it because I'm looking for not only my queen, but signs that she is there. So I can rest assured that I have a queen in that hive. So I then pull it and beautiful, full of bees. And that was full of capped brood, which I'll show you more of in a second. Go ahead, right? So you can get the next thing. Good job. So, can you go back to one? Can you see? I think you might have double done it again. Nope. 
start the war right again. So we look for, if we can't, we can't always find the queen. Even if she has a red mark on her, remember what I said, 40,000 bees? <laughs> now it's so easy to find one bee. So she is not, the girls have been very successful in finding queens. However, we can't always find her. So we at least need to find a sign that she has been there recently. So in this one, it's kind of hard to see right. Can you point to that one? And the, that's a real nice one. Those are eggs. People say they're like grains of rice. They are nowhere near the size of a grain of rice. They are tiny little breads. The queen lays them in the center of a cell and they stand straight up. <laughs> Tinier, yes, definitely. They are an egg for three days and then they become a larva. So over to the right. And you can see various signs. They don't look anything like a bee. They look like a worm, a grub. That is a larva. That is a baby bee. They are a larva for six days. They grow. They eat constantly, constantly, day and night. They eat all the time. By the time six days comes, they have completely filled that cell. And then can you point over to the far right right where we have some cat food? Way over. Yep. They cover them up. They tuck them in nice and cozy with a layer of wax. The bee then goes through the larva goes and becomes a pupa, and she goes through metamorphosis. She does spin a cocoon around herself. She grows eyes and hair and antenna and wings and legs and everything she needs. When she comes out of that, she's a full-grown bee, and as I said, she gets ready to work. She is fuzzier, so yeah, go back. Good job, guys. If you come back here, you can see how much fuzz these girls have on their thorax on the middle portion of their body um, as they work and fly and stick their heads in and out of cells feeding babies, their hairs do become rubbed off, especially on their thorax. So that's the only way we know we have a baby bee. She's very furry. Uh, the shiny in that frame is neck that they will thicken to honey. And usually above that is pollen because they're gonna mix that honey or nectar and pollen to feed those babies. So they have it all designed perfectly for taking care of their family. Okay, right? So you're looking for eggs basically and say, yeah, within the last three days, you know, clean it over. Yes, clean within three days. And if I hadn't been here, at least I didn't do anything. Like, you're absolutely right. And if I have small larvae, five days, if I've got the big fat ones, Six days, right? Because they're getting at the end. And then if it's capped, it's eight to 21. So then I don't have so much confidence. If I only find cat brood and no larva, eggs can also be really tough to see. Sometimes I do a lot of digital beekeeping. So I take pictures of my frames where I expect to find eggs and larva. And then I go inside and I blow it up and I say, oh, there's anything up there. So um, you're absolutely right, 100%. That's how within three days I've had a clean. Eggs are definitely tiny little small larvae is what I'm always looking for. And then that's just the life cycle. The queen only is 16 days because we need her sooner, right? If they're making a new one, I need a queen as soon as possible. So she is quick and the drone is bigger, so he is longer. Okay, right? And that's more capped group. So the Drone being the second biggest, they those are those bubbles that is capped going through. And there's always going to be some because they always plan for the future, even though that will not be with their queen, some other hive might be them. So there will always be boy um brood. And then the flat is uh worker bee, and you can see that one is kind of open. Um, that one is white, so it probably isn't quite finished, but they do crack. That one above to the left is um, a bee probably getting ready to emerge. And they just chew their way out of that wax and come out of a full grown bee. Okay, right? So back, back to swarming. So there are different situations where they will create a new queen. The left, we call them super seizure cells. So there's that peanut, and it's on the face of the frame, that's an emergency queen cell. So that means something happened to the queen that was there. And again, it very likely was a, a beekeeper. Um, you can see right point up here, you can see that one has that chewed hole in the side. That was a queen that 
So the one that the bees are on in the right, that is an open cell. That queen has already come out and then she has ripped apart. Yep, that one and the one at the top, she has ripped apart and destroyed her other queen. On the bottom, those queen cells are also called swarm cells. Let's take them on the one, two, three, four, at least five of them. They put them on the bottom of the frame. I don't know why, but they do. And those are signs of a swarm. So the queen is probably still in there. They're getting ready to go. And once you find those, like I said, you can create a swarm. I can take those queen cells and put them in another hive along with some more frames and some more bees and create an artificial swarm, possibly prevent it from happening. But once they've gotten to this point, even if you decrease the population by half by putting them in another box, they still may swarm because they have it in their brains that swarming is what they need to do. And they can swarm more than once. Okay, right? So this is all of a sudden, and when I'm out in the garden, I hear this noise, this very loud plane this loud buzz and my first response is oh no it's happening and sure enough thousands of bees because it's going to be about 20,000 bees are leaving the hive so all of those little specks are bees leaving this hive they go very close to their original home initially and they cluster in a tree that is a that is a swarm um, waiting for a new home so they will cluster usually within 500 feet of their original home. The scout bees then go out and look for a new home. So they don't find a home and then they leave and then go and find a home. They vote on it. How crazy. They well will dance back for them and they demonstrate the house that they have found. And some of the worker bees may go check it out. Put your new house. See what it's or not, they decide as, as a unit, we is in the middle somewhere, and then they all, and they can be hours, it can be days that that swarm will hang on the tree, and then off they go to their new location. However, her can reach it and himself. I can, you can see that's not the same one, that's a part of another office with several branches. We can cut down that swarm and I can take that cluster and put it in a brand new hive. I cannot put it back in its original home. That won't work. I have to put it into a new hive. They're very, very docile. Bees that are swarming are only looking for a new home. Just like we do and just like the girls did before we came here, they pack a snack. So they fill their bellies with honey. They fill up so they have because, and not only do they need a snack, but remember they have to make a new house and they have to have honey to be able to create wax. So they fill up their bellies and so they're calm. Their bellies are full. They're just looking for a house. So they're very, very calm. When you cut down, the first time I did it, I was not excited about it. Um, but they, they really is not that difficult. The problem is that they're, they're too high up in the tree. I had one that was really high and my husband said it was a small tree out of reach. And he's like, it's okay, I'll cut the tree slowly. And you cut it slow. You are cutting the tree. He did. So he slowly made cuts until it was low enough and I could support it. And we were able to catch that swarm. We did not catch any swarms this year. I did have a swarm, and that's why my hive is not doing well. So I, was, I did not see swarm cells. However, I missed it, and I found swarm cells, and it was they were open, so they've already swarmed. If I have open swarm cells, they have left because that queen doesn't come out until the family is gone. The queen that they that came out did not survive, so I had a queenless hive. So I have requeened it and we'll see, we'll see. But it's girl, girl time to only breathe. <laughs> when you say they're looking for a new home, but you mean they're, they're looking for a place to build a hive, right? So, so they may, so they may. I have set out my own equipment thinking because they will sometimes go into people put up bait hives 
uh, swarm traps. They put them up in a tree and they will go into those. They may go into a hollow tree. They may go into your home. They may go in between sides.